Let's take another look at a hypothesis test for the difference between two population proportions. So I have here a professor asked 245 students if they were satisfied with their grade on a test. Of the 95 students that read the textbook, 81 said that they were satisfied with their grade. Of the 150 students that did not read the textbook, 93 said that they were satisfied with their grade. At a 5% significance level, test the claim that the proportion of students that read the textbook and were satisfied with their grade is different from the proportion of students that did not read the textbook and were satisfied with their grade. All right, well, first thing is we have two different populations, the population of students that read the textbook and the population of students that did not read the textbook. So if you have a test, there are going to be students that read the textbook and students that did not. We have those two separate populations. Now, what we're concerned with is the proportion or the percentage of those two populations that are satisfied with their grade. So the first proportion, P1, is capital X1, which is the number of students that were satisfied with their grade from this population, out of the size of the total population of students that read the book, which is capital N1. That fraction gives me my population proportion from this first population. And in the same way, I can create that same fraction for those that were satisfied with their grade out of the total number that did not read the textbook. And I'll get that second population proportion. But I'm really concerned not with either one of these individually, but with the difference between these two population proportions. I want to see if they're different. Okay? So, I want to see if P1 minus P2 is a different thing than zero, basically. Because if P1 minus P2 is zero, that means that they are the same. But if P1 minus P2 is not equal to zero, that means that they're different. We could also check to see if P1 is bigger than P2, or if P1 is smaller than P2, but that would require a different alternative hypothesis. If it just says different, then I know that my alternative is just going to be that they're not equal, that P1 minus P2 is not equal to zero. So in order to do this, I need to come up with an estimate. And since I can't take all students that read the textbook before a test and all students that do not, I'm going to take a sample of my students that read the textbook and my students that do not. So I have X1 and N1 being 81, the total number of students that read the textbook that were satisfied with their grade, out of 95, the total number of students that read the textbook. And then in the second population, I have this sample, which has X2, the number of students that didn't read the textbook but were still satisfied with their grade, out of over N2, which is the total number of students that didn't read the textbook. So 93 students uh, didn't read but were satisfied with their grade, and 150 didn't read. So those numbers were given up here. Uh, 81 out of the 95 from this population and 93 out of the 150 from this population. And that's going to give me two sample proportions, p hat 1 and p hat 2. And what I need to do to estimate p1 minus p2, which is the parameter I'm concerned with, is I actually just need to subtract those two sample uh, statistics, p hat 1 and p hat 2. So to estimate this population, parameter p1 minus p2, I'm going to use this sample statistic p hat 1 and p hat 2. I'm going to subtract them. That's going to give me this number right here when I do that subtraction. So this is the difference between the two sample proportions that I'm using as an estimate of the population proportion. Since I'm using an estimate, well, this estimate comes from a sample. I can get this point estimate from a sample. That means there's a sampling distribution involved, and I can run a hypothesis test. So because, once again, this says different, the hypothesis test I'm running has an alternative hypothesis of not equal to 0. If it had said that P1 is greater than P2, or the students that read the textbook were more satisfied than the students that did not, 
then the alternative hypothesis would be that P1 minus P2 is greater than zero. Because I think that P1 is a bigger number, the difference would be greater than zero. And if I think P1 is a smaller number, or if I think that those that read the book were less satisfied than those that did not read the book on their test grade, then I would do that P1 minus P2 is less than zero, or negative, meaning P1, I think, is the smaller number. But because it just says different, my null hypothesis is always just going to be that P1 minus P2 equals zero, but the word different determines my alternative hypothesis to be not equals. If it were at most, it would be less than, and if it were at least, it would be greater than, but because it's different, it's just not equal to. So that takes care of my null and alternative hypothesis. That's the first thing you'll be asked to do on any hypothesis testing question. Next, we're going to have to come up with a test statistic. In order to come up with the test statistic, we have to figure out this sampling distribution here of p hat 1 minus p hat 2. Now, we can assume that that sampling distribution is going to be centered at the null value and the null value here is that the difference is equal to zero, that there's no difference between P1 and P2. That's the null value. There's no difference between P1 and P2. To come up with a test statistic, well, because of the fact that my alternative hypothesis is not equal to, I can use the pooled sample um, proportion for my standard error. So to find the standard error, I'm going to take that pooled sample proportion, which is this. It's what I get if I take the two numbers of successes from each sample and add them up and divide it by the two numbers of the individual samples added up. So I take the total number of successes and divide it by the total number in each sample. And that'll give me the pooled proportion. You can use that pooled proportion whenever the alternative hypothesis is not equal to, which means that we're testing the hypothesis that they're different. The alternative is that they're different from each other, the two population proportions. So anytime it's just that they're different, we can use this pooled sample proportion. And this is going to be my um, standard error squared. So my standard error squared, which is the sampling distribution variance, is equal to this. And all I have to do now is calculate that pooled proportion, which is 81 plus 93, the total number of successes, divided by 95 plus 150, the total sample size. That's the pooled proportion. And I can calculate this sampling distribution variance this way. This is the pooled proportion times its complement over 95 plus the pooled proportion times its complement over 150, the two sample sizes. And that gives me, when I calculate this, 0 0.0035. So I now know that the pooled proportion is this number, 0 0.7102, and I use that to calculate the variance of the sampling distribution here which is 0 0.0035. So that means my test statistic is a normally distributed test statistic with a mean of zero and a sampling error of, or a standard error, sorry, a standard error of the square root of this number. So the standard error is the square root of this number, which is kind of the sta standard deviation of the sampling distribution. And the mean of the sampling distribution is zero. So I can use this information since it's normally distributed. I can find a z-score. To find the z-score, I'm going to take the sample statistic, which is p hat 1 minus p hat 2. p hat 1 minus p hat 2 in this case is 0.2326. We calculated that from the two um, sample statistics, p hat 1 and p hat 2. And I'm going to subtract from it the null value, which the null value was assumed to be 0. And I'm going to divide it by the square root of that sampling distribution variance, which is the standard error. So it's basically the value minus the mean divided by the standard error, or the standard deviation. And this is what we get.
So if you take the value, which is p hat 1 minus p hat 2, and subtract the null value, the mean, the hypothesized middle of the sampling distribution, 0, you just get 0.2326. And you're going to divide that by the square root of the variance of the sampling distribution, or the standard error. This is the standard error. And we get 3.91. This is my test statistic. So to run a hypothesis test, the first thing you need is the null and alternative hypothesis. Then once you determine the sampling distribution, it should lead you to a test statistic. The only test statistic we've studied up to this point is normal distribution or normally distributed test statistics. We'll see others, but this one is normally distributed, which means we will that means we can use this sample statistic to come up with a z-score for our test statistic. The z-score that we found is 3.91. So we're going to use this 3.91 and we are going to come up with a p-value to represent the significance of this sample. Now if this sample is significantly large or significantly small, meaning the, uh, the statistic, the sample statistic is either really, really, really big if the average is actually zero, or really, really, really small if the average is actually zero. And the probability of getting either a sample our extreme, uh, as extreme as ours or more extreme is what we call the p-value. So the p-value is basically for a two-tailed test where the word was different, so we had not equal to. This is called a two-tailed test. The p-value is either the area to the left of the negative test statistic doubled or the area to the right of the positive test statistic doubled. Because our test statistic is positive, we're looking at the area to its right, and we're going to double that to get the whole p-value. If our test statistic was negative, we'd look at the area to the left of it and double that number to get the p-value. So there's various methods of finding the area to the right of this positive 3.91 on the, um, the bell curve here. I like using Python. So this is the Python code that would do it. Import scipy.stats as stats, and then because it's the double, because it's a different, it's a two-tailed test, I'm going to multiply two times the normal CDF, but I'm doing one minus the normal CDS, CDF because I'm looking at the area to the right. So I'm looking at the area to the right of 0.2326 in the sampling distribution, which is the area to the right of 3.91 in the standard normal distribution, and I'm going to double that number to get my p-value, and this is how I'm doing it with, with Python. When I do that, I get this as my p-value. So this is the probability of getting a number as extreme as 23% as the difference between my two proportions. So the difference between my two, my two sample proportions was about 23%. And the probability of getting a difference that big if the actual difference between the proportions was zero is this. It's less than 1%. It's a really, really, really miraculous sample that I collected if the null hypothesis is true. So since we don't believe that this is a miraculous sample because our p-value is so small, we know that whenever the p-value is less than the stated level of significance, that's enough for us to reject the null hypothesis and say, this is probably bogus. We're calling BS on this because this is too far away. This is too large of a test statistic. It's too um, rare. It would be too rare to get a number this large. How rare would it be? This is a measure of the rarity. So this is what, 10, 100,000, 10,000, 100,000? This means we, could we would only get a sample this large 9 out of 100,000 times. So if we did this 100,000 times, we'd only get a sample with this large of a difference in the two proportions 9 out of 100,000 times. That's extremely rare. And we don't believe in the rare events. So my initial conclusion then is that because the p-value is less than the significance level alpha, I'm going to reject this null hypothesis. Because what we're saying is 
this null distribution, which we're assuming that the null hypothesis is true under, if this null distribution is true, the sample I just collected has this probability of happening, so this is probably not true. Reject the null hypothesis. We don't believe in miracles.